Today's edition of Resetting the Stage is entitled Who You Are Before What You Do, Culture First Organizations. And we will consider the following questions. How do arts leaders build cultures aligned with missions and values? How can organizational culture support effective vision, strategy, and operation? What internal shifts can contribute to a more equitable and impactful arts sector? It is a distinct honor to welcome our illustrious panel. Elena Muslar is a career and mindset coach for future innovators, change makers, and trailblazers. As a community-driven native of South Central Los Angeles, with over a decade of experience in multidisciplinary producing, Elena has crafted creative professional development experiences for a wide range of organizations, including Loyola Marymount University, where she currently serves in custom build capacity as the Associate Director for Creative Professions and Strategic Initiatives. Elena holds advanced degrees in theater arts management and production from Call Arts and LMU and has been recognized by Los Angeles County for her contributions to cultural equity and inclusion. Jenny Billfield, president and CEO of Washington Performing Arts in Washington, D.C., has positioned the organization as an important incubator of main stage community and education programming and the commissioner of new works. Her vision is transforming the organization with an emphasis on unique programs and collaborations, including SHIFT, a festival of American orchestras with the Kennedy Center, along with other recently spurheaded initiatives. Buffield is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania in music. Her work has been recognized through awards from ASCAP, the League of American Orchestras and Musical America. Since founding classical movements in 1992, Nita Helms has pioneered the model of concert touring for orchestras and choirs that emphasizes cultural exchange with local communities in 145 countries. Classical movements worked with major groups, including the Minnesota Orchestra, on their historic tours to Cuba and South Africa, as well as hundreds of other orchestras and choruses, such as the National Seattle, St. Louis, and Cincinnati Symphony Orchestras. In response to COVID-19 disruptions to the travel and music industries, classical movements has pivoted towards domestic touring and international tours for individuals and small groups, while also producing the first live chamber concert in the United States since the shutdowns. Julie O has more than 20 years of marketing, audience development, and customer experience. Prior to her current role at the Miami City Ballet, Oak served as Vice President of Marketing and Customer Experience at the New York Philharmonic, where she achieved record-breaking sales, led an organizational rebranding, and the development of a transformative digital marketing strategy. Through her firm of marketing, she also provided individual clients with consultation and creative solutions focused on customer acquisition and relations, product positioning, creative marketing, web development, and video production. Kane Tamasen Reedus became the Detroit Symphony Orchestra's Senior Director of Community and Learning in 2015 after playing flute in the DSO for two years as a minority fellow and coaching the orchestra's civic youth ensembles. Previously, he was Director of Corporate Partnerships for the Sphinx Organization. He holds music degrees from Rice University in Texas and the University of Redlands in California, with additional studies at the University of Michigan and Mozarteum in Salzburg. At the DSO, he develops, administers, and fundraises for in-reach activities that include free concerts, in-school performances, and educational partnerships. Our Q&A facilitator today will be Elena Haig of Classical Next, who will return to the broadcast in the second half of today's discussion. But first, to begin, it is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Scott Harrison, to set the stage for where our discussion begins. Former Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra's executive director, Scott Harrison continues to expand upon the orchestra's commitment to artistic and community impact through an unwearing commitment to transformative music making, cultural conversation, and partnership with organizations of shared values across Los Angeles. 
Having previously worked for Indianapolis, New Jersey, Boston, Dallas, and Detroit symphony orchestras, Harrison holds degrees in bassoon and political science from Northwestern University, where he was elected to the Political Science Alumni Hall of Fame and Southern Methodist University. Harrison serves as a founding board member of Blume Haiti, an organization that works with Haiti and international partners to develop leadership skills in young musicians and create opportunities for social and civic change through music. Welcome, Scott. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Gosha. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. Good morning uh, from here in Los Angeles. For those on the East Coast, good afternoon. For those in Europe, good evening. I just want to add my thanks to our fantastic and amazing panelists for giving of their time and their thoughts today. And I encourage everyone in the audience to check them out and learn more about them and the amazing work that they all do individually and at their organizations, because they're all um, leaders in this field and leaders in the work we're all doing to make a more just and fair society through the arts, which I think is a focus for so many of us. Um, there's sort of two ideas underpinning this entire discussion today. And the first is up on the screen. It's a quote from the management consultant, Peter Drucker, who I know many people are familiar with, and it's very simple and evocative culture. Each strategy for breakfast by the way, it eats tactics for lunch, it eats fundraising for dinner, culture eats everything. And what that simply means to me is you might know where you're going, you might have the right car picked out for the journey, but if you can't stand the people sitting in the seats next to you, you're not gonna get very far. If you're driving from LA to New York, maybe you'll make it to Santa Fe before you bail. So culture really underlines everything. And shortly our panelists are gonna share their definitions of culture. But I think that one thing we all agree on is that at the heart of culture is people, that whatever the group, the organization, the system, um, the program, the project, it is people who are uh, first and foremost at the heart of culture. So that focus on people is really critical. That's the title of our webinar today, who you are before what you do. And what I wanna do for just a minute before we dive in and hear from our, our experts and our thinkers today, is share two of the briefest examples. These are uh, of two early 20th century pioneers who come from very different worlds and very different fields, but I think have something in common. And that is that they both had an intense focus on people in building their organizations, their systems, and their programs. And the first was the legendary British Antarctic explorer, Sir Ernest Shackleton. And many of you might have heard of Shackleton's endurance, a, a, a famed and yet ill-fated journey to reach the South Pole with an overland trek through Antarctica. And what happened is early in the journey, his ship became stuck in intense pack ice in the Weddell Sea, just off the coast of Antarctica. And his crew, all 27 of them and their dogs had to abandon and camp out on the ice flows of Antarctica for eight months. And then their ship, as you can see in this picture, their ship ultimately sank in the, the Weddell Sea and they were stuck on the ice flows of Antarctica with just their lifeboats, um, some munitions, some supplies. And over the ensuing year and a half after those eight months, Shackleton successfully navigated his 20, I believe it was 27 men, of course at the time only men, his 27 men to safety, back to civilization. All of them survived. They stayed together. They did not lose a single person on that expedition. And it became one of the most enduring and amazing feats, I think, of leadership. And what was underneath it all, as over the years, individuals studied the case and the journey of Shackleton, it was the people that he chose. He hired not necessarily for skill set. He hired for personality and fit and alignment with him and the mission that he had envisioned. So when the mission changed, when they no longer could reach the South Pole, his crew was able to shift with him through a crisis. This maybe feels familiar and rings true for a lot of us today. The other individual was one of the most amazing and pioneering American women um, I think we've ever seen uh, uh, in the business world and in the philanthropic world and frankly in the arts world, and that is Madam C.J. Walker who was a pioneering titan of the hair care industry in the early 20th century. And Madam C.J. Walker, who um, was born just two years after um, the end of the Civil War to parents who were slaves and became the first self-made 
um, not only black female entrepreneur in the country, but female, I believe, entrepreneur in the country. And again, she did it with an intense focus on people and who she surrounded herself with and how she projected the image of her company, because there were many companies offering hair care products um, for African-American women, but very few that I think were doing it with such a focus on who the salespeople and the agents and the culturists were at the organization and what the dignity and the worth and the pride of being an African-American woman in the early 20th century America could be. And I think it was that singular focus and that story that she was promoting more than just the product um, that really made her successful. And it's why her legacy has continued, I think, to this day. You know, so Shackleton and Walker, it's fascinating. There's actually, I'm just a lay person, but I'm discovering all these in, uh, similarities. Not only the years they lived, they lived almost virtually identical years uh, around the turn of the 20th century. They both unfortunately died young of heart disease. Um, they both were motivated by wealth and fame. Clearly, it was a driving force for both of them beyond their other more noble aspirations. Um, and um, uh, not that there's anything un uh, ignoble about pursuing wealth and fame in the right way, perhaps. But in any event, uh, also the sense of other. I think it's very interesting that that um, for uh, Ernest Shackleton, he was an Irishman in a incredibly stratified British society based on class and ethnicity where he was trying to navigate to the highest echelons and, and ultimately enter those echelons. And I think Madam C.J. Walker was fighting sort of two senses of other, not only being African-American in a country that was still incredibly segregated and, and, and highly unjust, but also being a woman that even within the struggle for civil rights among the African-American community, women themselves were often relegated to a secondary rank. So she was fighting two senses of other. Um, but I think these are both amazing stories. I hope you'll sort of see how they kind of pull through the rest of our uh, conversation. Our roadmap today, and I don't think this will be a straight linear journey. I think we'll kind of come in and out of some of these themes. Our roadmap today is to talk about organizational culture, how it might align with your personal ideal culture, how we are all shaping arts and culture, and this more, um, I think, macro sense of what we want this field to be and what we want it to represent, and how through doing all that, we can impact the culture, the society, the wider sense of who we all are, because we don't do this in a vacuum. We do this to really, I think, make a difference. So that being said, I wanna start with a lightning round. I'm gonna to go to each of our um, panelists in quick succession, and I've asked them to think about a very simple, but very difficult question. And that is, how do you define organizational culture? And the first one up is Elena Muslar. So Elena, how do you define organizational culture? Hi, thank you, Scott. I'm so excited to be here. So the way that I define organizational culture is as the collective contribution of values and experiences that individuals bring, which inspire and influence the foundation from which an organization chooses to create and operate and curate their work. Thank you, Elena. I think there's something so beautiful that you speak both about the collective and the individual and how they come together to ultimately form the culture. Next, I want to ask Nita. Nita, how do you define organizational culture? I believe in organizations, culture is defined by the beauty that very different individuals bring to create a common goal and achieve something beautiful for the benefit of community or mankind in the most fun and most equitable and most exciting and fulfilling way. That's my goal and I believe that organizations are essentially there to work together towards a goal. For some people it's financial, for some people it is of fulfillment. But together the culture is an amorphous, ever-changing, live being in itself, that a group of people get a joint personality. 
Thank you, Nita. I love the energy in your definition and the sense of beauty and fun and journey uh, that underlies it. Kane, Kane, what is your definition of organizational culture? Hey, Scott, I'm going to fit in two for you in my 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> one is, I think of it as a feedback loop of how it feels to be part of an organization and then how you behave in response to that. There really are two sides to that. The other way I think of it is um, every day, the people of an organization answering the question of what matters in that organization. Thank you, Kane. That idea of the cycle that the culture is constantly being fed and reinforced and evaluated and moving, um, I think is really critical. Julie, um, from down in Miami, Julie, what is your definition of organizational culture? Uh, very simply, I think the organization culture is a, a set of collective behaviors by people in your organization. It can come about uh, organically, um, many times obviously influenced by the people you have at the top and how they behave, but it's most effective when it's very intentional and built through a defined set of core values. And these core values are the set of beliefs that drives daily action. It's ultimately tied to customer experience that you want people to have and the way that you want to be known by the public. So I come at it from a brand point of view. You know, when you have a brand strategy and you have a brand promise, it's aligned to the, the very mission that you're on this earth um, to provide, right? The, the purpose of your organization, then it comes back to having an organization culture that can deliver deliver that mission so um so what are those what are those behaviors that you want people to have what are those values that you want baked into your culture that you cultivate you promote um you uphold and if you know and it's the guiding principles for how you want people to work together um so that you can you know uh without any disconnects or you know Across your organization, that no matter who your constituencies are and which department that they interact with, that everybody is seamlessly delivering the same brand and brand customer experience. So that's how I see the culture driving. Um, you know how, how you you know how the behaviors influence the strategy that you you put up there and want to um, ultimately um, deliver. Thanks, Julie. And you raised such an important point that we might get to a little bit later in the panel, how much of culture develops organically and how much of it has to be intentionally cultivated uh, every single day of the year. Um, and then finally, if there's any room left, I hope we've left some room in the definition of culture. Jenny, it's your turn to share how you view organizational culture or define it. Sure, well, there absolutely is a, uh, a Venn diagram and an overlap here, but I guess what I would add is that it's a sense of belonging that people have with an organization, um, a sense of resonance and alignment um, with the mission that there is something at stake um, at, and where there's collective effort to raise um, awareness and commitment and participation in achieving something that is extraordinary. So I see it in a very, uh, in many ways, a poetic uh, and um, uh, strategic way. Uh, there's a commitment to shaping the culture that it isn't it as much as it is defined by the person and the tone is set by the person who leads the organization and the board and others involved in governance. I'll speak about that later. Um, culture doesn't just happen. It's not a performative uh, exercise. It's something where people commit to um, upholding values and express and exhibit mutual accountability to each other. So it's not a question of show me, it's a question of how do I show up and, um, and have a stake in the success of this. Um, it's also about the values and um, uh, definitions around community because culture doesn't exist in a vacuum and we derive a great deal of what our organizational strength and brand promise to use Julie's um, expression is from who we are what group of people and uh, organizations we're part of and how we define community, um, artists, patrons, students, and so on. That's really important in defining culture. Um, it's about uh, 
an, an intergenerational awareness because organizations have history and they have future and the way history is honored and celebrated um, is very much a driver uh, of how we look forward and interpret through contemporary lens. Um, and I think it's about transparency. Uh, at least I, I feel very strongly that we should have one narrative um, and culture is defined by being unified around that narrative that we treat um, people and um, whether they're inside our organization or within our community with um, respect and candor and that messages are not calibrated to audience, but rather a culture, the culture reinforces um, the message and the principles and the strategy and the values so that whatever way you look at the organization, whether it's through programming, governance, staff, um, that you see what the organization values and you understand the culture of that organization. Thank you, Jenny. And when you said the idea at stake, I think many of us feel there's more at stake than ever now. And so yeah. this focus on culture probably feels more, more primary than ever. Before we dig deeper into our conversation for our attendees, say we have the, the, the first of two polls because we wanna get a sense later on of who you are and who your organizations are. And the first poll question, I think we'll pop up in the screen in a second, is does your organization emphasize building, sustaining and evaluating culture? Do you feel you're at the top of the pack? Yes, we regularly engage in this work. We devote time to it. Do you feel you sometimes engage in this work at your organization? Do you feel that you rarely engage in this work? You thought, unfortunately, no, your, your organization does not spend any time on this work. And, and if you have multiple organizations and perhaps choose the one that you, you spend most of your time with or you most want to answer the question <laughs> regarding, um, we're going to come back to the answer to that poll a little bit later. But I want to stay with Jenny for a minute. Um, and because one thing that um, I've always been impressed about uh, with Jenny's work at Washington Performing Arts. I know it's much larger than her. That's part of her definition of, of culture, but the organization invests and devotes significant time and resource to this idea of building and sustaining culture. And that is a choice that is not without sacrifice, so to speak, because you only have limited time and resources to invest. And so it is easy often for an organization or for a leadership to say, we're going to back burner culture. We're going to just focus on the, the doing, the presenting, the performing, whatever it might be. But um, sort of to uh, Julie's word earlier, intentionality, there's an intentional decision at Jenny's organization to put the time in to be a culture first organization, if you think that word or that phrase is appropriate. Jenny, why do you invest that time and why have you, how have you found return in that investment? Well, you know, it, it, I, I appreciate the question because it's very much about this sense of um, accountability and history for me coming to Washington Performing Arts um, and inspired by our founder, Patrick Hayes, who in you know, 1965 uh, created this, this mantra that we hold close, which is everybody and nobody out. And with a, um, a phrase like that, there are tremendous opportunities to interrogate how we do this and to challenge ourselves to fulfill the, miss the mission. It doesn't mean everybody comes to everything for free all the time, but what it does mean is that we define community very broadly. It's not something that we colonize and uh, outreach to. It's actually our community is a community of artists, of patrons, of audiences who come, whether there are tickets charged or not. Um, whether they're um, young people in our arts education programs or adults with great experience. So we, we challenge ourselves to, um, to define um, some of the terms that are very often sort of very casually used and to go back to some of our core values and our mission, this sense of commitment to uh, being an inclusive organization. Um, how do we express our everybody and nobody out at a time when um, white supremacist and um, racist structures are being um, challenged and exposed and looking for uh, the ways that we can be smarter, more impactful. Um, and to be honest, you know, I'm, I'm a very, um, I'm a very transparent leader. I mean, people, I don't have 
only occasionally have a, a, a pretty still face. I, I get very excited about things. I respond. I'm very engaged with people. I love to hear feedback. And um, I've had to build a um, in myself a sense of um, comfort in hearing and metabolizing criticism so that it can come through and uh, improve our organization and to challenge people to receive um, criticism and observations. Because when we say everybody in, nobody out, um, that also means that there are people who don't necessarily agree with everything that we embody. And how do we nurture conversations and welcome people with divergent perspectives? Because it isn't just about building a, you know, a feedback loop that reaffirms and reinforces what we might or might not share as a community, but it's it's building an awareness and a sensitivity to um, to differences in opinions. I I found one of the most important things, and I touched upon this just a tiny bit before. Um, the, I'm very committed at the beginning of my tenure to making sure that whichever way you looked at Washington Performing Arts, you would understand what we value, so that we're not creating a value statement and then looking and feeling and programming differently. So when we have um, grown our board of directors, when we created our junior board a few years ago, um, as we have a women's committee who has been with the organization and evolving since its very earliest days, and as we've shifted and expanded our programming or rather restored it to some of the, the, um, the sort of diversity of its earliest days, there was a real, um, eagerness to make sure that vertically we looked uh, as we um, as we felt guided by the mission. So if you look at our board of directors, you'll see people of different ages, different backgrounds, people who fight you know, equally for uh, support for our gospel as they do for our orchestras, for our education programs. So we have um, a, a really robust board that um, is engaged and active and spends time. For me, that is culturally a very specific choice because um, a organization, and we have a very big board, it's in the, uh, it's about 35 people at this point and has gone as large as 40, but there are a lot of opinions, a lot of backgrounds, a lot of um, different personalities, and we have a culture where people meet each other where they are and where they challenge each other, have side conversations, bring conversations, uh, and questions back to me. It's not um, a board where one presents and presides as much as engages and creates that sense of shared stake. The same thing with our junior board, which is for people 40 and under, um, very engaged in programs. They show up in the conversations, they take responsibility as with our staff, as with our women's committee. Um, this sort of culture of sort of, of uh, bi-directionality is a lot to um, manage because there are a lot of there's a lot of governance. There are a lot of um, strong, brilliant, committed people, and so the culture has to be elastic enough to provide an environment for people to have that sort of exchange. It is time consuming emotionally, um, intellectually. It requires an organization to create space for it and for channels to remain open. And if channels aren't open, to have the confidence and the the um, the comfort to say, you know, something isn't making its way through. Um, I don't feel like we're living what our yeah. culture has been. Um, so it the sort of um, openness, having a stake, and frankly, uh, the the level of tolerance for divergent thought. That's a, a cultural choice, but it doesn't mean that everyone who participates harmonizes. It means that we coexist with a certain amount of discomfort or dissonance, um, but that the goals and the values are aligned. Yeah. And it, it's sometimes a tricky thing to um, to navigate, but if you're in it, you're in it. Yeah, Jenny, I think that's, that's such a powerful idea that there's strength in harboring dissonance and that part of a resilient culture is actually having space for the culture in a way to be maybe not the culture be challenged, but viewpoints to be traded back and forth. And I want to bring Kane in here because, Kane, I think that when we think about divergent viewpoints and dissonance, your channel 
of the Detroit Symphony, you probably deal with a lot of that because overseeing education and training ensembles and the 1,000 or 1,200 youth who participate every week in the programs of the DSO, you've got kids, you've got parents, you've got community members, you've got board members, you've got staff members, you've got donors, you've got a lot of people in the kitchen, so to speak. And I'm really curious about, um, one, what Jenny started here, how in maintaining and sustaining a culture in the words that you used earlier with a feedback loop, you make room for divergent and, and differing thoughts and opinions, and also just how you um, manage the idea of the culture within your ecosystem, your channel or department, so to speak, of the Detroit Symphony, meeting the larger culture of the organization. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, I think the, and the community engagement side of my area at the DSO is is even more filled with uh, a variety of of opinions and needs and wants and um, priorities and complaints, et cetera. <laughs> you know, it's a um, it's a it's a tough challenge to make uh, a symphony orchestra something that is beneficial to to everybody around us. That that doesn't happen easily or certainly automatically, and um, you know we have to do that with recognition of how we've gotten to this uh, stage of where we are as a field and as an orchestra and as an art form and the fact that that hasn't included a lot of people for a long time. Um, I'm grateful that at the DSO that, um, that we really work hard to address that. And um, we, uh, what drives our educational mission and is a good example of our culture at the DSO is that, um, we kind of have a two-pronged approach to our programming. So we're trying to be there for um, the absolute best and brightest, the people that have leveraged every resource to get as high as they can get. And, you know, if they're kids, they want to be in our top youth orchestra and they want to go and be orchestral musicians. And we want to provide a pathway for that. At the same time, we're also trying to um, provide resources for tens of thousands of kids in schools anywhere through our webcasts, but particularly in the city of Detroit, um, to just have music as a part of their learning. Um, and then within our training ensembles, we, we've been more and more engineering around creating access. So providing instruments, scholarship, transportation, all the kind of stuff that, uh, that more El Sistema model programs offer. So we're a symphony orchestra trying to do all this stuff and that just stretches us all the time and brings us into contact with um, people just across every range of socioeconomic, geographic, racial and ethnic, religious, uh, every every demographic you can think of, we're trying to make a place. Um, part of our culture at the DSO is that we maybe try to do too much. So that's, that's <laughs> just an admonition right there. Um, part of our culture is that we say yes when we feel like something aligns with our mission and then we figure it out. And that makes for a lot of work and a lot of kind of mandate that we then have to live up to. Um, it, is, uh, it is something that you need to handle in a responsible way. You can't just say yes all the time and expect the same number of people to deliver on everything you've just said yes to. So whether it's leadership above me or me or the people I'm working with, um, you know, we do try to bring discipline to our yeses. So we, we want really badly to say yes. That is part of our culture. We want to figure out these tough problems, but we have to do it in a sustainable way. For me, sustainability is an incredibly important aspect of culture because I think we're, we're kind of bred within the field to think of sustainability as fundraising. And everybody's a fundraiser. So it's part of your job. Get the money in the door one way or another. Um, and that's true. And I totally subscribe to that and I participate in that. Um, but sustainability for me is also just incredibly about the sustainability of the people you have around you. And um, I work hard to get people around me that I think do a good job and do it in a positive spirit and do it for the right reasons. And if you're lucky enough to get those people, you don't want to mess it up and lose them just because you tried to squeeze 15% more out of them. So um, for me, sustainability comes down to us as a department or departments specifically, um, 
part of our culture is that yes, the work must be done, but you as an individual are responsible for figuring out where your limit is and bringing that to the attention of those around you. So if 15 things have to happen and you are smart enough to know you have time for 13 of them, the other two don't go away, but we have to figure out as a team how they get done or what we change or what moves. Uh, we can't ignore priorities, but we also can't just um, be subservient to them and have that essentially ruin our lives. I mean, let's be real. Like if your job is taking over your life, if you want that, great. If you don't want that, it's one of the worst things that can happen. And that becomes toxic for everybody around you. And, um, you know, we're all swimming in the same pool. We want to keep it clean. We want to keep it fun. This is, this has got to be a good environment. So I just really believe strongly in trying to work with the capacity of the people around you. Um, when you do good work, when you do it for the right reasons and you do it in a way that brings people together, the resources do tend to follow. It's not always immediate, um, but uh, you know, over the last five and a half years, we've, we've built out a lot of programming that didn't exist before at the DSO, and we've built staffing around that programming. We've started hiring people with different skills and qualifications. Um, recently, we hired a school partnerships person whose previous experience was with City Year, and um, that's not a music gig, but that's definitely an in the classroom, in the weeds, figuring out how to fix the problems person. Um, he also happens to be a musician, and so that is a perfect fit for us. So he, he gets in there and figures out those classroom problems. At the same time, he understands what we're trying to do and how we're trying to do it. Um, that's a, we, we wrote a job description that looked for that kind of person. And that was a different kind of person than we had hired for any of our positions previously. We're right in the midst of, of a very big undertaking called Detroit Harmony, which is this audacious goal of a kid for uh, an instrument for every kid in the city who wants one and working systemically across the city to make sure there is music education for every kid. And that's bringing a bunch of people together. And by the way, doing that in a way that also brings in workforce development. So we're training people in the city of Detroit to do the work that we're creating by creating music programs. So there's that. And, you know, the skills that we're looking for for that, again, are not like knowing how to play the violin or knowing how to write an educational curriculum. It's like coalition building. It's familiarity yeah. with economic development partners, those kinds of things. So the culture is something that you build into the structure of your team. It's something that you reinforce every day. How you do the work is incredibly, incredibly important. And for me, the people doing the work, I want those people to stick around for a long time. I don't care if two years is the average in the field. I want people for longer than two years. I like them, we do good work together. Let's not have to start that over every two years. So I think long-term you get more when you work within people's capacity, you find the right strengths and you just keep going forward. Okay, and this uh, idea of sustainability as a component of the culture and the layers of sustainability and the ways you might define and think about it is so compelling and I want to bring Julie in here because I think another issue of sustainability is the authenticity of the message and the connection with the audience and how true does that ring and Julie talked about this a little bit in her intro but Julie has spent so much time in her career at the New York Phil at the Miami City Ballet really being an advocate for this idea that the messages you promote to your audience have to be real and they have to be grounded in what the institution actually is Otherwise, they're not going to go very far. And her tools are brand, her tools are marketing, her tools are communication. But Julie, uh, I'm starting to get into the answer before I even ask the question. I want to know how you, from your perspective, because you are so thoughtful about the audience and hearing what Kane said about sustainability and communities and hearing what Jenny said about bringing everybody in and living that, how do you think about culture from your seat to someone who really has to care about the audience and and them feeling that there's something real about the institution okay um i think uh so the perhaps the way i'll talk about it is kind of the way that people experience other brands so you know there's um nothing worse than a brand that talks about who they are and what they do and you go to buy it 
you go to experience it, whatever it is, and it's nothing like that, right? So they talk about whatever it may be, quality, you know, if you're buying this brand of clothes, you know, how well it's going to hold up is what you're thinking quality is and how well the fabric feels and the quality perhaps about the customer service, but you buy it and your experience is anything but, right? So it just becomes um, just what marketing says, what the advertising says, and it really doesn't hold true. So, you know, what really um, the authenticity really comes from the culture, you know, does the culture advocate for, does it prioritize those values that it takes for everyone to have and think about every day as the priority in which you behave, the which you um, deliver your work um, to ultimately affect um, and deliver on what you're advertising, essentially, right? The reputation that you want your company to have. So, you know, um, at the New York Philharmonic, um, it's such a, it's so steeped in its <laughs> culture already. So when we did our brand strategy and looked at sort of what it is that the that customers really wanted, what they got, but what it maybe fell a little short of, you know, um, excellence was at the top of that, but perhaps warmth was not. Right. And so um, so over the many years as long term strategy, it's really about how you bake in the warmth. And it's really that focus on customer experience and where does that customer experience? What does that look like across all of the different streams, whether you deal with the advancement team, whether you you're going on the website, whether you're coming into the venues? What does that look like when you deliver on welcoming? Um, excellent customer experience. So the conversations that took place internally always came back to that customer experience. Um, you know, when we were building website and we looked at one uh, one execution versus another, well, you know, came back to, I don't know if it, does that really deliver on the best customer um, experience? So it always came back to that and it was really about delivering that authenticity uh, to deliver on the brand. Um, you know, the brand experience that we wanted to people to have so it could ring true what that reputation and what that brand was. So it tied the it tied the culture directly to the experience that we wanted to be known for and what we wanted um, to, you know, for the customer to have. In Miami, it's a, it's um, you know, the um, it's a different, it's a younger company. It's 35 years old versus 176 years old. Um, so the culture was much um, you know, it's it's more youthful, um, and so the the challenge there uh, was really about um, looking at what did it need at this point in time. You know, it had created um, an amazing uh, reputation as an excellent, um, you know, nationally uh, known ballet company. Um, in 35 years, it had created this. Um, it had done what its peers in the top tier had you know, um, was already established for it and, and took 70 something years, you know? And so it had a really a lot of great, um, great, you know, the brand reputation. However, it was inconsistent simply because the culture um, had never been quite looked at with a great intention of aligning it to the, the brand profile, right? The external brand profile. So we started there with, um, Again, intention, um, what are we about? You know, what is it that's really great about the company? Um, and where are we, where do we have some room to grow, right? Um, to deliver fully on that. Um, and as we looked across all of the different customer experience, all the brand experiences that different constituencies, um, you know, um, and interviewing all the different constituencies, whether those were students and their parents, through the school, ballet school, or through uh, the donors and board, through advancement team, um, the customer experience, the web, et cetera. Um, what we realized was that we didn't have, um, we didn't have a singular brand promise. That singular mission um, wasn't quite as, uh, that purpose wasn't as defined. It had to be more than the function of putting ballet on stage. It had to be something much more deeper and inspiring. Um, and after we went through all of the um, all the surveying and stakeholder meetings and all of that, external and internal, what we came to was a brand promise that was really about being 
where artists and audiences together um, take this journey to leave the ordinary behind, right? And so, and then, you know, we have the definition and um, differentiating points under what that means. But that ultimately was it, it's just that simple, where audiences and audi art artists leave the ordinary behind. When we look through that, and then, um, and then when we looked at our culture, you know, we, we looked at, okay, what are the brands that we have to, what, I'm, I'm sorry, what are the values? What are the defined values that we need to have? What, can, what strength can we build on that already exists that we can just really build strongly on it? And what are the areas that, what are the values that we don't quite have yet that we have to develop in order to deliver on this promise that we're gonna make to our public? And so we came up with six values of core values to rally around, to coalesce around, and to protect. So that was pursuit of excellence. That's definitely something that we have and we had to have consistently, right? Um, joyful generosity, which is something that came from the dancers. They have this joy, joyful youth of all, there's a camaraderie that is very differentiated in the way that they work together and support one another. And that's something that we want to have throughout the administration on the board, et cetera. Then there's accountability, which was inconsistent, right? Depending on what teams that you were looking at. Um, collaboration, there was a lot of soloization, right? And so when we work together, the idea of working together um, means that we can have, you, you know, we'll have the greatest achievements come from when we band together. So that 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 defines how we come together as a team, how we have our meetings, how you know it it informs everything from something small to you know the bigger things and um, and you know authentically Miami gave us our differentiation right um, doing it in the style of that Miami flavor was really the way that we struck a difference between our ballet company versus another ballet company like New York or San Francisco what have you. Um, and then, you know, elevation, of course, is really what we're about and what we're delivering emotionally. So these are, you know, the six values that we um, felt we needed. We're going to build on it with intention. Um, we're going to um, use it as a guide. We're going to use it as a way we look at everything and say, are we living this um, in a way that's authentic? And so, and and when we look at it that way, it's the, it's, it's how we want to also, um, Leverage our resources. It's the way we ask, you know, should we be doing this versus that? Should, you know, how do we prioritize one project over another so that we're deriving the best value out of all that we do with the small teams that we have? So, um, and we're in that journey now, right? This sure. work was basically we started in uh, September of uh, last year, and we're, you know, it's been. <laughs> This journey's been a bit disruptive because disrupted because you know we've had the COVID, but you know this is something that's a priority for us. We're in this journey. We started it. We're a little further into it. We're still training internally around it. So, um, but um, but it's really inspiring and people are really excited yeah. and 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 it's showing up in the way we talk and the way that we're in our language and our meetings, um, the way we kind of question, you know, well, is that really true to our values, you know? And, and that's that's when you see intention and, yeah. and, uh, and authenticity. Thanks, Julie. I want to remind our uh, attendees for a moment, if you have questions, because in not, in not too long, we're going to get to some Q&A. If you have questions, you can be posting them in the chat, getting them out there so that uh, our team can get them uh, queued up and ready for our panelists. You know, I want to zoom in and then zoom out for a minute as I go to Alina and then to Nita. And it's funny hearing uh, Jenny, Kane, Julie speak. I think, oh my gosh, I would love to work for Washington Performing Arts. I would love to work for the Detroit Symphony. I'd love to work for Miami City Ballet. Like these are institutions that are thinking about it, that are getting it right, that are centering these conversations. But this is a little bit cherry pick. This conversation. This is not every organization in the arts field. And I want to go to Alina here and and actually pose a question that came to me from one of my neighbors. Um, one of my neighbors, um, Anna, just recently graduated with her uh, master's in arts history, and she's uh, going to be starting her career as a curator. And the thing that she was saying to me, I think, speaks to the twin pressures of this moment. On the one hand, there's this intense uncertainty around COVID. On the other hand, for so many of us, there's this intense certainty that we want to be 
as strong and bold and, and just as forefront as possible right now about our belief that we have to dismantle racist structures and we have to be more equitable and we want that to show up in our work and we don't want to hide that part of who we are. And it's, I think, even more heightened for folks who represent the communities that are the brunt of, um, of those pressures. And so what she was essentially saying is, what will I do in a time when I, because of the uncertainty of COVID, I need a job, I want to take the first job, I want to get the experience, opportunities might be few and far in between, but I don't want to work somewhere where I feel like I have to hide who I am. I don't know if this is resolvable, but Elena, you work with so many young people entering the field, and even before this moment, I know you get this question and this tension a lot. How do you think about that as the person, the young person starts to onboard themselves into their career, and they need to meld the personal with the organizational? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so oftentimes when I'm in coaching appointments with students, that sort of conversation comes up on a regular basis. It's the tug between the personal and who they quote unquote need to be as a professional. Um, I believe strongly in the marriage of that and that you show up to whatever organization that you choose to be a part of with your whole self. If you are of the mindset that I have to leave a certain version of myself at home, or I can only come to work in this way, or I can only wear my hair a certain way because that's what's gonna make me be acceptable, for a particular community, that over time will create toxic environments for you mentally. It'll also create um, spaces where you feel otherized, and then you'll internalize it, thinking that it's your fault that you know you put yourself in a bad situation that you probably shouldn't have in the first place. And so, a lot of the conversations I have with students focus on the impact that they want to make in the world and then backtrack that to where they can start. It doesn't, it's not about, you know, the, the past versions where you go and you commit to something and you're going to do that for 20 years. The millennials and any generation after us, we're expected to change careers. I think it's like up to 12 times in our lifetime. And so I encourage them to think about that overall thing that's pushing them forward right now, and then consider the steps that they wanna to take to build that. Each step lays a, a groundwork and a foundation for the ultimate change that they might wanna make in the world that might be this big, hairy, audacious dream. It's like bad in a way, but it's good. <laughs> it's that good bad. And so I think about it in the sense that like, Culture makers have to be trailblazers because they're in the business of developing constant change. So you have to think about like, where do I wanna see change and where do I wanna be a part of change? So then that's where alignment comes into play. And it's thinking about where do your own personal values align with the professional values of an institution or organization that gets to have you on their team. I also do a lot of coaching around, it's not packaging yourself for a place. It's being secure in who you are, the value that you add, what you can contribute to that place, and then showing up and sharing that with them. You are a gift and you get to offer that gift to the world. It's about how do you choose to choose to unearth that for yourself. So that's where individual self-assessment comes into play that has to be sustained throughout your professional career. Because if you don't sustain it, then you'll fall victim. And oftentimes you can fall victim to organizational culture if you're not secure in your own individual mindset. And I think one thing that we haven't really brought up too much is what what does like the cultural makeup do to add value to organizational culture? Like how do we actually bring into play what what our cultures have taught us? And where did culture originate in your own individual life? For me, culture originates in being black 
it originates in being American. It originates in being, you know, from a certain socioeconomic background. And I come with all of that to whatever place I go to. And, and so I'm in constant conversation with that in relation to how I show up in my work. So whether that's, you know, when I was working at the Thurball Cultural Center, saying I'm going to advocate for spoken word as an art form that needs to be showcased on a multidisciplinary platform so that people understand that this is not a coffee shop, you know, in the back uh, art form. It's an art form that's, that's culturally rich and extremely diverse and relevant in terms of providing different perspectives and access for people who may not have ever engaged in that way previously, because oftentimes some cultural art can be seen as less than and others can be seen as elitist. So my goal was to bridge that. Um, and so I, I work with students to help them understand what's your overall goal and what's the overall dream and how do you bring that to fruition in the places you inhabit and ultimately infiltrate at times. And that's the way I kind of look at like the work that I do and the people that I train to trailblaze. I was muted. You. Elena, okay. you just, I was I was silenced because what you said was so powerful. But um, what you just said is a perfect segue to bring Nita in here because Nita was sharing with me a little bit of her story the other day because when she started uh, her career, um, uh, Nita, you made a very I think conscious decision about how you wanted to show up and how you wanted your organization to show up and what you wanted to promote in a field that often could be very narrow. And I think your perspective is fascinating because if um, we heard a little bit about, th you know, three specific organizations or four also here in the New York Phil story, if we heard a little bit um, uh, from Melina's perspective about how the individuals entering the organization showing up with the gift that they have to give, you're on a regular basis working with a dozen, 15 institutions rotating each year while minding your own culture of yourself and your organization. So you're sort of playing this out in multiple times uh, throughout the course of a year. Nita, hearing what e e Elena said, hearing what everyone else said, what are you thinking about the cultural journey and how you decide to show up and represent the cultural and the, the culture and the values that you believe in uh, in the arts field? Oh. Are you, you're muted now. Oh, so I'm sorry, Nita, we can't hear you. Uh, we'll have to, um, we'll have to come back in a minute. I'm now unmuted. Now you're unmuted, excellent, thank you. Okay, good, I, I just, I thought this do a quick rundown because there's so much time that's passing quickly and everybody has so much to say. Um, our company, uh, you know, I started it so I could make it anything we wanted it to be. And um, I came into an industry steeped in tradition and very slow to change. Even to this day is my general summary. I admire those institutions that have been here for so long their product and their brand is like goals to me and my upbringing with the you know, piano lessons and singing from the age of four in, a, in, in India, where we were very interested in Western classical music. But I, I have certainly, I could say, <laughs> very, um, very clearly been frustrated over the course of the 28 years that I've had this company with how slow to change many institutions have been. And, um, you know, our culture as an organization, we're a small company. I look at it as a circle. We don't have a hierarchy. I look at myself as in the middle, and then everybody around me is equal distance. And we all pair up in different ways, or different people in the circle pair up with each other. Um, very interested in collaboration and consult consultations, but not in long meetings, but just should we do this? Our dis decision making is nimble and we don't, if we're fortunate, we don't have a board or, you know, all kinds of other people to report to. So we take decisions like that. 
uh, half of our amazing staff are have been with us an average of 17 years and uh, all together as a company we're an average of almost 12 years so that's something i'm very proud of um, they're very different personalities but i would say um, extroverts, introverts, uh, gay, straight, men, old, young, all kinds of people, but we are all can do daredevils. We want to do things that are difficult. We want to do things that have not been done. We believe very much in um, going out in the world and bringing the world's cultures, and especially my main client base is American, showing them the possibilities of of what the world has to offer. Uh, I'm very much in the world of orchestras, and I think there's a lot of orchestras here. We do have ballet as well, but we are very much also in the world of choruses. I believe choirs have been far more adventurous and much more nimble and flexible, and they've been more open to other repertoire than orchestras. I think orchestras are slowly coming to that. Um, so I've been very fortunate with being able to mix that. Um, and when I've dealt with organizations, I have to say a lot of the questions right from the get-go, we started with Russia and Ukraine, and then we went to Turkey and South Africa and Cuba and Vietnam. I mean, these are all my first countries, and this is back in 1992. So you can imagine that it was a lot of the unknown but exciting, and lots of culture in those countries and taking people there. But asking them to actually go out and meet people and not just looking at the Kremlin, but actually visiting the synagogue or listening to the music or the Russian Orthodox music or, you know, helping this orphanage or whatever. A lot of times it was like, why would I do that? I mean, I am saying back in the 90s, but I have to say kicking and screaming, I feel like the whole world's on board now. And I'm very excited about that. Um, I feel our work is not driven, even though we are for profit in the non profit world. Um, our, our ethic and our goal is not making money as much as making experiences and giving people a one of a kind um, adventure, but also really authentically um, in, intermingling and collaborating with people. And I feel. Um, what's happening now with black lives matter or the Moutu movement is now awakening up in the united states of of how much more we all need to do and i'm proud of our past but even i will say we can do more and i feel like we're well placed to do that i mean when i say why wouldn't you go to ecuador or peru or go to south africa or go to cuba and look listen to music and and you know these are these ex possibilities that you can do no longer do people say to me, but I want to go to Germany and I want to go to Europe or, you know, now China. You know, it's just been an exciting evolution in the last few years. So for me, our culture, I feel, has been what it is, and we continue to maintain that. We're very nimble, as I said, but we are so excited now to have slowly managed to convince a lot of people that I feel really ran this industry and didn't pay much attention to what we were doing and perhaps still don't, but I feel a lot more people see the, see the joy in that. Thank you, Nita. You know, uh, one thing that's actually really heartening is I have the results to the poll and it sounds like many of you in the audience feel that you might be in a similar place to what you've heard from Nita and and others about their organizations. 32% of you say, yes, we do regularly engage in, in cultural work. And 50% of you say sometimes. Um, it is only 18% who say rarely, and, and none of you said never. I see that as being very heartening. There's a good uh, a group of organizations represented on this call. And I know you as individuals are driving and pushing that change at your organization. So thank you very much. Um, we're gonna make some time now for some Q&A from the audience. So uh, Aliena, from Classical Next mm -hmm. is gonna come on the screen for just a moment and throw a few questions to our panelists. I think you're muted, uh, Aliena. You're right, hello. I hope you can hear me now. Thank you so much for the discussion so far. We have had a couple of questions from the audience. 
And the first question is from Michael Ake in Chattanooga, Tennessee, who is the chair of the performing arts for the McCallie School. And the question is for Elena and Jenny. Sometimes the systems that are a part of the culture need to be disrupted. Have any of you had experience in approaching such a situation? And if so, do you have any suggestions for those of us faced with this task? I do. Yes, it's a great question. Very it's a great question. question. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's interesting. It goes back a little bit to the people that you hire and the mission of the organization. And um, when I, you know, coming to a, a place like Washington, D.C., most of my career was in New York City, then I was in Palo Alto at Stanford. Um, there are there are opportunities when you're when you approach a new opportunity with fresh eyes and you begin to see where things are siloed and where certain um, where certain opportunities lie. So uh, when I came to Washington and was driving around trying to figure out how to where we might live, my husband and daughter were still back in California. Um, I rented a car and drove to every neighborhood that had a metro stop uh, within Washington D.C. And I often did it on a Sunday, and I'd hear music coming out of churches and all sorts of community gathering spots. And I thought, wow, you know, this is, I, we have a lot of teaching artists. We're in a hundred public schools. We have our main stage programming. We don't own or operate a venue, but there seemed to be a gap here in how local artists were showing up in our main stage programs. And so working with um, uh, a longtime supporter we created the Mars Urban Arts Initiative, which is now called the Mar Mars Arts DC, supported by the Mars uh, company and family. And the goal was to uh, really shine a bright light on the incredible talent that exists in Washington DC and to find a consistent and resonant way for local artists to uh, be presented and to be compensated for their participation in our programs and to identify resident artists, to feature them in our um, fees and brochure, not to create something that was a community arts program per se, but to, to find the local um, talent that perhaps had been purely focused on community-facing programs and to honor the work uh, alongside, whether it was the LA Philharmonic or uh, a Hayes piano artist or a jazz artist we would commission. So we've had artists in residence We've had as many as 60 local partnerships with different organizations and artists to um, engage important conversations and frankly, to take our role as a community um, committed organization and to express that through art, through conversation and through um, engagement. But that required uh, a certain reconsideration of how we blended our programs so that they weren't as, um, programmatically delineated and sort of cross-pollinated each other. And I committed early on to not having programs that I would describe as a barnacle. Like if, if a program didn't really fit in with our organization, if we didn't talk about it at a board level, if we didn't seek dedicated funding, if we didn't staff it properly, then I would consider that a barnacle and probably better done by another organization. So this uh, interconnectivity or um, intersection of programs and mission was um, a very significant change. And, and that's something that I've, um, when I've talked with our interns, you know, some of whom are, are graduate students in arts administration, I've, I've described that as sort of a, a sniff test in a way. You know, organizations often maintain programs because of legacy obligations or fear of alienating a donor. Um, and actually we, we had conversations with our donors about the programs we were doing as we were transforming them so that we weren't, we weren't saying to any donor, oh sure, we'll keep that going, even though we scratched our heads and said, why are we doing that? It doesn't feel like we're bringing value. We actually went to the donors and sat down with them and looked at the, the way we um, assessed impact, we looked at data, we looked at uh, anecdotal feedback that we received. And for funders, we worked to guide them to programs where we knew impact was important to them and we might be able to deliver it differently. So I, I mentioned that for a couple of reasons. One, just this a, a approach of a full integration of programs that, um, and also frankly, shedding of programs that others could do well. We had summer camps that we used to do. There are a lot of summer camps in the wow. DC region. We moved those um, 
to a lower priority and, and reinvested the savings in our gospel choirs. So there were a number of ways that we were able to build up some existing programs by um, prioritizing them, but also just the, the, the commitment to bringing everyone along with us. We, we spoke to our board, we spoke with our donors about the changes we were making. And it's that transparency, not just checking the box, but saying, okay, this is what doesn't work, being willing to risk not receiving renewed funding, but truly in every case where we, where we made these significant changes for strategic reasons to optimize our investment in other programs, donors came along and new donors joined. Um, so that's one example of just yeah. the internal work and the commitment to mission and how we, uh, how we navigated that in some critical ways. Great. I can see lots of shaking heads, but um, or nodding heads, I should say. But Elena, could I ask you to comment as well? Can you repeat the question? I heard it and got excited, but I needed to kind of get me back <laughs> into that headspace. Sure. So the questions are, uh, so it's two questions. Sometimes the systems that are a part of the culture need to be disrupted. Have any of you had experience in approaching such a situation? And if so, do you have any suggestions for those of us faced with this task? Yes, okay. That got me back into the, into the game. <laughs> so um, I think about disruption as the act of dismantling. So if, it's, if, you're, if you're thinking about like, what are the things that are actually disrupting the, the culture that you want to be a part of, that you feel like they have the potential to be, um, it's considering what it is that needs to be dismantled. So first you have to name it. Um, that might look like doing like actual research and, and deep work on like what it is that you're dismantling. So is that systemic racism? Name it. Is that oppression? Name it. Like, and what does oppression look like at the institution that you work at already? Um, do an audit of like anti-black or, or colonized ways of thinking that are impacting your way of working at an institution that you believe has the potential to be more equitable um, or inclusive. So once you have that all built up, then claim that as, a, as, a, as an element of the work that you show up and do. So that may look like in a meeting if something is a little off or you know, um, an audience member says something that doesn't, they didn't quite get the point of what um, the, you know, the show was about. That's an opportunity to educate and allowing it to not always necessarily fall on the shoulders of, of the people who might be otherwise. Um, being a part of that dialogue and making that a normal occurrence and a daily practice in your life, whether you're, you know, in the institution or outside of it will only make you stronger for those moments when it's uncomfortable and you have to you have to show up in order to disrupt um, and and also i i recommend using like fear as as a funnel for focus so whatever it is that you're afraid of doing that makes you super nervous if it's like this person donates millions of dollars to us and i'm scared they're not going to donate the millions of dollars like Consider the, the worst that'll happen, but then imagine what that could turn into. So imagine that person doesn't donate again, but imagine you stood up for something that was powerful and impactful. And then all of a sudden, all these other people also stand up for that same thing too. You might get a bunch of smaller donations from a larger community, and that can create a, a stronger impact over you just getting that one from that one person who was creating essentially a day dictatorship. And then as to answer the second part of that question, um, personal experience. So I'll, I'll refer to something I just did within the last couple of weeks. So at my university, um, we, there, there was very delayed and, um, you know, beautifully worded and crafted responses to the unrest in our society right now around Black lives. Um, we got a lovely email that talked about all the things that the university is doing to, you know, support um, the efforts. And that email came 
week, a week or so after protests had been happening and, and the university like, like constituents were already invested in the work that was, that was going on. So it felt somewhat delayed. Um, for myself, before that email came out, um, I took a Friday off. And I was very intentional about what I was doing. I essentially called out black from work. I specifically said, you know, I am exhausted from the emotional labor that has been added to the duties that I was not hired to do in this particular position. Um, I spent the week educating white colleagues on their um, white ignorance and guilt um, and helping them understand why I'm hurting and having to be answer the question of how are you over and over again. And so I basically shared that that brought me to the level of where I need to take a day for me to be able to show up at all for any, anyone else. And I put an out of office email that specifically designated that point and said Black Lives Matter at the end. So any person in the institution received that message from me. Um, because that's a value and I want to stand true to that. But I also put in my, um, my Outlook calendar that everyone could see that the next week, um, Ju Juneteenth was coming up. That's not an automatically included holiday on any calendars. <laughs> you have to add it in yourself. So I added that in and I said, this is a, a holiday that I will have to use vacation time to take when it's the celebration of the fact that there that you know black lives realized that slavery wasn't happening two years after it was quote unquote abolished so that was a sad fact i put that in there and then next thing you know i come back my boss has said oh we saw you know the stuff that you've been doing and and there's some things in the work later that day email out from the entire that went out to the whole school was specifically stating that Juneteenth would be a designated university holiday. And um, I know for a fact I contributed to that, not only because I put things on my calendars and emails, but because I also tagged them on social media. And I used what small platform I have and big voice I know I'm capable of using to try to push change forward. So I believe it starts at an individual level for you to do anything at an organizational level and that we all have that power within us. It's just about taking the fear and turning it into fuel and then owning it. Great. Thank you, Elena, for that. Um, we've got two more questions. So just also uh, uh, watching the time, if we could keep the answers for the next two a little bit shorter, sorry, and not intending to cut any of you off. But this next question is for Julie. It's from Kenny Oi of Rondo Productions in Malaysia. Uh, Julie, can you share with us a bit more about initiating a culture? For example, if you are in a new city where most people have minimal awareness of music and arts education, making it difficult for ensembles to grow. What would your advice be for those working to build a culture that values the growth of arts education, for example, in my case as an arts manager in Southeast Asia? Okay, hi. Hi. Wow, that's quite a question. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to think of how do you um, do this in a, in a short answer. Um, you know, it's really about connecting with, with your community um, and finding out um, the entry roads, right? Where are the areas of uh, barriers, uh, barriers of entry, right? So what, and where are the connected connection points? So in terms of, you know, ballet, um, I'm thinking of ballet in, in Miami. Miami is really a, um, in the early, sort of earlier pro, um, stages of really uh, growing its arts. So um, in that way, it's, it's a little similar to what you're talking about, maybe a little bit more further along. Um, and um, what we looked at was, you know, how do we get more into some of these communities that where ballet or dance is not, well, ballet is not um, 
part of the culture, right? It's not an um, easy access point. Um, and we're looking for, and we look at, you know, where there are ac access points, right? And there are usually points um, where there's uh, familiarity, right? And so Miami is really about rhythm and dance and, you know, may not be ballet, but there is a connection point there. So in what ways can we talk about um, ballet and dance in a way that can resonate and how can we, and we get the feedback from the community themselves, right? On what, what's relevant to them. Um, why would they want um, this in their lives um, and Brit and find ways to, you know, um, bring them into it. So it's really about bridging cultural connections, um, listening and working with your um, community leaders um, to bridge and really understand how you can connect that way. And also, of course, going back to the barriers, understanding where the barriers are. And that's also a conversation through community leaders and finding out what those are. Great. Well, actually, this last question for Kane follows on nicely from that. And Kane, I'm going to ask you for an additional challenge of trying to get it down to 30 seconds, if you can. <laughs> the question is from Tanmay Sharma, and it's, is there a way that community members from outside an organization can help contribute to shifts in the culture of an organization with respect to its educational activities? Is there a productive role that members of the community and other stakeholders outside of management can play in shifting the internal culture of a performing arts organization to be more education focused? Mm, yeah, absolutely. So the people outside the organization are the reason the organization exists and they vote with their dollars and their attendance and the relationships that they generate. Um, there's people of all levels that can have influence. If people are asking the organization for educational opportunities, that means something. If people who can offer support are offering to support organizations um in delivering educational programs that's something if it's a person who doesn't have financial support but will be willing to volunteer and they can bring some skills to bear um, there's a lot of ways and really just even generating more interest and enthusiasm for those programs the reason people don't do programs is not usually because there's a market that people don't want to sell to it's because they haven't identified that market and they don't know if they can sell to it if the market helps identify itself that de-risks the whole proposition so even just bringing together parents families teachers whoever it is that you would like to have be part of your educational community bring them together send a, a joint letter ask for a meeting reach out to a staff member that you think will be open to it guaranteed if 30 people came to me and said hey what about this kind of a program i would talk with them about that so you don't have to write a million dollar check to make a difference and you do get to vote every time you buy something or show up for something or contact somebody thanks kane i want each panelist to get in the in your mind sort of a 30 second concluding thought in just a minute nita i'm going to start with you but based on everything we've heard today gosh we need another 90 minutes but i'm going to throw up one more quick poll that might be a little bit of a summation um does your organization's culture align with your ideal organizational culture we've been talking about this a lot today do you feel that you're personally aligned with the culture of your organization yes to a degree no or you don't even know because it's not clear what your organization's culture even is. Um, so I'm gonna go around the horn here and ask each of our panelists to share a concluding thought of 30 seconds or so. What, so what's sticking with you? What's something in your mind? What's something you wanna leave with our attendees today? Nita, why don't you share something that you're thinking with the crowd? I think you're muted again, Nita. Am I good now? Yes. Okay, good. Somebody greater than me controls my sound. <laughs> Higher power. But anyway, um, I think the assumption that uh, classical music is not um, an essential and it's you know a, a part of the of the community is where part of the problem arises when you go to the Congo and they have a started a symphony orchestra um, or you go to India and they've started Western classical music orchestra. They still have their traditions, but I think the world 
uh, is very limited by thinking that one part of the culture belongs to one group of people and audiences and organizations need to move beyond that limitation. Um, I feel that when someone says we have to bring in all these stakeholders for decision making, I think that's very important that people have to move quicker and they have to understand that they have to be more versatile and they have to be more innovative. They've got to let go stuff. And that's what I'd like to say about culture for all of us. Thank you, Nita. Julie, your thoughts. I'm always, look, whoops, I'm always looking for that volume button. Um, what I, well, so when I think about, uh, you know, what we've been talking about today, which is really about culture um, and sometimes needing to shift that culture so that you can ultimately reach your organization goals. The question I think to ask is, you know, what is at stake if you stay the same? What is at stake if you don't change? Um, and I think that's a really powerful question to ask, um, you know, the, the folks around the team um, to really get a conversation started about what values the organization really have to uphold, what five values are gonna uphold above everything else to make sure that you hit your, you know, the goals for why you're, why you're existing. Thanks, Julie. Kane? Yeah. Um... There was a great phrase in one of the earlier questions about how um, how do we get a community to value arts education, that kind of thing. I think one of the most important aspects of organizational culture is that you bring together people in programming that value the community you're seeking to serve. A lot of places by default or simply by not contradicting um, this statement end up thinking like, how do we get people to value what we have? you will always lose in that equation. <laughs> That's the wrong way. It's how do we value the people we are trying to serve? And value means a lot of different things, but if you take it from that stance that they are the ones with the power, they are the ones that you need more than they need you, you have a different approach, your organization has a different culture, and that's one that's gonna be much more mission focused, higher impact, and better to be a part of. Jenny. Sitting here, like giving every gesture that I can. I think that these are awesome um, uh, observations. And I would say, um, and I made a couple of notes, that this is plan to play the long game. I and mean, this is something that is not going to shift overnight. Um, we have to take a longer view and understand that people are at different points of um, the continuum of their learning and their practice. Um, every effective culture is based on trust. Um, successful cultures or effective, impactful cultures, let me put it that way, um, are porous and they're elastic. So as there is a COVID crisis, as there's an economic downturn, as there is heightened um, awareness and action around some of the systemic racism, if you don't have a porous, nimble culture, it's not going to be able to respond to something that is deeply impacting the people within your organization. Um, I would say that effective cultures uh, experience gratitude for the opportunity individuals are given to live their values and express gratitude for the people who are committed to them, um, that they're invested in community, um, and that uh, the, mission, the mission matters. But yeah, this is a long game thing. Elena. Okay, I'll be quick. So, <laughs> um, number one and overall, continue to invest in self-education, period, point blank. The fact that you're here right now, good sign. Continue this work and integrate it into daily practices for yourself and the people that you serve or manage and dedicate money to that. Self-education isn't always free. So make sure that you're actually placing value on what that means for your organization, the people you say you want to have in it, and the people who, that you say you want to stay in it, because retention is a big part of this as well. Um, I also would say change your language as an organization. Stop serving communities and start embracing communities. They already exist. 
they already have lots of value and they can add to yours. They are not the thing that you go to or you outreach to. It's the thing that you welcome in um, and you embrace to, to create a, a more inclusive um, organizational culture. And then the, the last thing I'll say that comes from the context of, of what the whole point of this panel was, who you are before what you do. Um, thinking about even at the beginning, Scott had a, a, a slide that was up around Madam C.J. Walker, and it was a picture of her with her whole staff. But what was labeled underneath that was that they were culturists and agents. So I, I challenge you to think, how are you a culturist? How are you a change agent in the institution you just so might occupy or in the world that you are a part of? And how does that equal the social impact that you want to lay on the world? Thank you, Yelena. Thank you to all of our, our amazing panelists. Poll results, 21% of you highly, highly aligned with your organizational cultures, 58% partially aligned, 16% uh, not aligned, 5% unfortunately you don't even know what your organization's culture is. I wanna say the two briefest of things, simple acts. They, it takes emotional burden and mental energy, but simple acts can move culture and make space. Even though cohesion matters, how can your culture of your organization make space for the cultures of all the individuals and communities you want to embrace and have at the table. So with that, I want to again, thank all our amazing panelists. I want to thank our presenters and sponsors. I want to throw it back to Gosha, who's going to close it up and let us know what's coming up next from Global Leaders and our other partners. Before thanking today's fantastic panelists, I would like to take a brief moment to share with all of you the preview of our next edition. Two weeks from now on, on July 23rd, the Global Leaders Program, the Spanish Association of Orchestras and Classical Next invite you to join our next panel discussion at this same time. The upcoming session is entitled Overworld a Stage, the Modern Day Performer, and will focus on the following themes. How are artists pushing the boundaries of performance? Can spontaneity and flexibility make a permanent return to programming? What does the life of a modern day performer look like? These themes will be addressed by a diverse expert panel, including Danae Dorkin, founder and artistic director of the Molivos International Music Festival, Rafael Payara, music director of the San Diego Symphony, and Kenny Savelson, executive director of Bang on a Can. More panelists to be announced soon. And links to this session are now in the chat. And now uh, we conclude by saying thank you to today's exceptional panel, Elena, Jenny, Nita, Julie, and Kane. On behalf of all the public tuning in, we really appreciate you sharing your perspectives with us today. And of course, huge thanks to Scott Harrison uh, and our colleague Elena Hagen, Classical Next, for your help to moderate and facilitate. Thanks to all of you who have joined from around the world, and we look forward to seeing you in two weeks from now on. Until then, please stay safe and healthy and have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much. Bye.